Okay. Um, last topic before a couple of clinical notes is just how much urine you produce per day and what impacts that. So generally, um, people will produce about 1,000 to 1,800 mils of urine per day, and it's affected by a few different things. Of course, your urine volume is affected by your blood pressure. And so on average, lower blood pressure, less filtration, less urine, higher blood pressure, less uh, more filtration, more urine. So GFR varies with blood pressure. Um, but remember, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system will be triggered when you have low blood pressure. Um, so... Um, and then your um, final volume of urine is uh, affected by your blood concentration, which is like stuff that you've known since you were a kid. If you drink a lot, you pee a lot. If you don't drink a lot, you pee a lot. You don't pee a lot. But um, what's the relationship between there? It's actually ADH is the relationship. So basically, if you drink a whole bunch of water, then the water concentration of your blood increases. And what it does is it inhibits secretion of ADH. So what you don't do is you don't reabsorb that last percentage at the distal convoluted tubule. So, and then you pee a lot. So the relationship is really, if you drink a lot, you inhibit ADH secretion and you don't reabsorb at the distal convoluted tubule water specifically, and then you pee a lot. So that's the relationship. But if you de are dehydrated, if you don't drink a lot, then what happens is the water concentration of your blood decreases and you secrete ADH because you detect that hypertonic blood at your hypothalamus and secrete ADH from your posterior pituitary. And then um, you do reabsorb at the distal convoluted tubule, do reabsorb water at the distal convoluted tubule, and you don't pee very much. So if, you're, um, it's, if you don't drink a lot, you do secrete ADH, you do reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule, and you don't pee a lot. That's the relationship of the blood concentration. And then there is the temperature relationship, which is basically if you sweat a lot, you don't pee a lot. And then also if you're cold, you pee more for a different reason. So when you're exposed to high temperatures, your cutaneous vessels dilate and it activates the sweat response and you lose both fluid and ions. And as the fluid in the body decreases, basically the water concentration in your blood decreases, and then you will secrete ADH and also aldosterone usually because you're going to lose um, sodium as well. And then regulated uh, reabsorption of both sodium and water will increase. So your urine volume will decrease. So basically if you're hot, you sweat, you lose water and sodium, and then you secrete ADH and aldosterone, and then you don't pee very much. Um, but what, about, what happens when you're exposed to low temperatures? When you're exposed to low temperatures, then what happens is your cutaneous vessels will constrict and the blood will be shunted to your core vessels, which increases the pressure in the core, which will increase GFR. So if it is you know, negative 10 degrees when you are camping, you are definitely gonna have to pee because it increases uh, pr blood pressure in your core. Okay, so let's just do a couple of um, clinical notes and then we're done. I want to talk about how, how diuretics work. Diuretics that are chemicals that increase your urine volume and they're sometimes used to treat hypertension. Um, and some diuretics work at the proximal convoluted tubule and some work at the distal convoluted tubule. And some actually kind of don't do either place specifically. Okay, so diuretic medications. Um, some of them are really, really effective because even though this isn't regulatable, um, it's non-regulated. There are drugs that can inhibit the non-regulated reabsorption of um, sodium and therefore water at the proximal convoluted tubule and then um, kind of at the loop because um, they can impact what's being pumped out here. And what happens with those is they're super effective because if they can hit 65% plus this percentage, which I think was 15, yeah, then you can, re, uh, you can inhibit a lot of reabsorption of sodium and water. But what happens is that means that if you inhibited it here, they would actually deliver a whole bunch of sodium to the distal convoluted tubule, and your body would go, hell, that's a lot of sodium in the distal convoluted tubule, and try to reabsorb it all with, with aldosterone. But remember, aldosterone costs you generally potassium, and so what happens here is these are great for causing you to pee a lot, really good diuretics, but since they force all that sodium into the distal convoluted tubule, what happens is there is the possibility for a really dangerous loss of potassium 
because if you didn't do it here, you'll try to do it here. And when you do it here at the distal convoluted tubule, it'll cost you some potassium. So a dangerous loss of potassium ions is possible with these diuretics. So usually when you're on these, like Lasix, which is furosemide, I don't know how to pronounce that, um, you will also be administered, for instance, potassium drip, okay? Um, some diuretics, though, don't affect this or this. They just affect this. They inhibit the regulated reabsorption, which is not as powerful because they can only do like 35% of the sodium and then a certain percentage of the water can follow that. Um, so some diuretics interfere with aldosterone. They're aldosterone antagonists. Um, and so they're not as effective, but they also will inhibit your potassium loss. So they're also not as dangerous like spironolactone. Um, so those are potassium sparing diuretics. And then there's some other things that have diuretic effects. Alcohol has an, a diuretic effect in part because it um, inhibits ADH secretion. So it's actually an anti-anti-diuretic. And then caffeine actually increases blood flow everywhere and a little bit of blood pressure, so it increases filtration. And that's why it's a diuretic. And then there are also the osmotic diuretics, and the osmotic diuretics are something that get, gets pushed out. It's a big non-penetrating solute and has no mechanism of reabsorption. So as it goes through the tube, it kind of acts like glucose as it goes through the tube, pulling stuff in. These are often sold over the counter in, for instance, like Don's water pills or some premenstrual medications. They're um, so sold over the counter. They're not as effective as either of these, but just so you know, any diuretic can be potentially um, life-threatening if used improperly because you're going to lose a lot of fluid and potentially a whole bunch of ions and cause ion imbalances as well. So um, that's, those are your diuretics. And then just the last little thing is to talk about kidney stones or renal calculi. Kidney stones or renal calculi, oh, look at this little bastard. They are when in usually the calyces or the pelvis of your kidney, you have ionic compounds that will crystallize, calcium or magnesium salts. Um, and these will usually do this if you do not have a lot of fluid to dilute the amount that's in there or if you really change your pH. So what happens um, leading to their formation is a decrease in fluid intake resulting in really concentrated urine, so I'm more likely to crystallize. If you change the pH of your urine with abnormally as alkaline or acid urine, um, or ingestion of a ton of mineral salts, like in um, diet sodas. Um, diet sodas do a couple of things. They um, are really, really salty, and they are really acidic, so they increase the likelihood of this. Or you can have an endocrine disorder like overactive parathyroid glands, which dumps calcium and phosphate into your, um, into your blood and therefore into your urinary system. So what do you do? Um, you prevent this by drinking lots of fluid, especially before bedtime. But don't limit um, anion intakes. Don't limit your, for instance, calcium. Um, you can limit your... Um, your um, don't limit, sorry, cation intakes. Don't, um, you can limit anion intakes. Um, and then we won't talk about dialysis because we talked about it before, but it's based on diffusion and not filtration. And there's a cool text box about end-stage renal disease and dialysis. And then I put uh, a little extra practice worksheet. I won't collect it, but it's there for you. And then uh, urinary system's done.